Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the break. Once again, my name is Devin Eckberg. I'm Chief Learning Officer for the Investments and Wealth Institute. It's a pleasure to have you here for ACE Academy. And uh, I'm very excited for this next session for, with Olivia Mitchell. I'll introduce her uh, to the audience now. Uh, Olivia Mitchell is the Professor of Insurance, Risk Management, Business, Economics, and Policy, Executive Director of the Pension Research Council, and Director of the Bettner Center on Pensions and Retirement Research at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Fantastic school, and we value our partnership with this school so much. Professor Mitchell is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her research focuses on pensions, risk management, financial literacy, household finance, and public finance. So Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have you here. You've contributed so much to the organization for so long, contributed to our publications. Uh, it's really an honor to have you here today. Thank you very much for including me in this event. Whoops, I went one too fast. Can you go back uh, one, please? Still getting used to the, um, the, the controls. It's a pleasure to be here with the Investment and Wealth Institute, and thank you, Devin, for your introduction. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is what kinds of topics will be front of mind post-COVID, assuming we're getting through COVID. And so the, one of the topics that I wanted to cover in particular is how to enhance longevity risk management. But under that heading, I actually had six different themes. First, will COVID help or hurt Social Security? Second, there's the age old question, should people delay, defer Social Security claiming? Third, how can we do a better job managing longevity risk? Fourth, how are we going to deal with persistent low returns and potentially guarantees? Fifth, the big topic in Washington these days is should uh, required minimum distributions or RMDs be eliminated? And sixth, the topic near and dear to my heart, what's going on with financial literacy and how can we help control dementia in terms of the financial implications in later life? So um, first of all, to turn to the first topic, uh, will COVID help or hurt Social Security? Social Security, as I'm sure you know, has been uh, inching towards insolvency for a number of years. And the newest report from the Congressional Budget Office indicates that the Medicare Trust Fund, the Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, is going to be insolvent within three years. And this is something that I think many of us talking to our parents, our clients, our, ourselves, need to do much more thinking ahead about. This is gonna be two years earlier than previously forecast due to COVID-19. Social Security had already been forecasted to not be able to pay its full benefits uh, by 2034. It's $53 trillion underfunded in expectation. And in the wake of the pandemic, some have now estimated that the date of fund depletion may now be within eight years. So these are not long-term forecasts. These are forecasts very close to home. And part of the reason is lower payroll taxes were collected due to job losses. And um, as yet, people have not increased their claiming very much because unemployment benefits and stimulus checks help them keep going for a while. But the time may come when you start to see big increases in claiming. This is a picture of the um, percentage of workers still working during April to July relative to the same period in the previous year, comparing uh, this uh, 2020 with 2019 by age. So the gray bar, and this is for the 15 to 24 year olds, indicated that almost 53% of these folks were working in 2019. That had dropped to 37%. And you see the other declines across the, the board. The 65 plus had a decline in employment as well, but interestingly, not necessarily as large as some of the other ones. So decline in employment. The good news is that almost half of older U US workers can work remotely. And so especially in the 65 plus, people that are worried they might not be able to do well in retirement 
almost half of them can work remotely and many of them are doing so. A big problem that confronts our labor markets, however, is that if you have to take public transportation to go to work, that is still a very scary endeavor uh, in the current situation. My corner of the world, New Jersey, New York, PA, et cetera, uh, you can see 30% either take subway, elevated rail, or some other form of public transportation. And nobody wants to get back into those crowded subways or buses right now. So that presents a big obstacle to the labor market getting back in business. Again, excuse me. Now it is true that COVID deaths are, have been much more prevalent in the older population, as you can see from this figure. And fortunately, the little ones have been somewhat protected. However, it's important to remember that the share of COVID deaths is relatively small, even for the older population. So this represents the fraction of deaths, 100% of deaths for people less than one year of age, one to four, et cetera. And the percent of people that, of the total deaths that occur that can be attributed to COVID is still relatively small in the US. Um, whether that will continue to be the case, we can only hope. But so what I, the point I wanna make is that COVID is not bailing out social security. COVID is having a terrible impact on the people that it has affected, but the world's older population, people, people over the age of 100 are going to, is going to continue to grow and it's been projected to, in fact, increase over, well over 100. In fact, some actuaries say that the baby that will live to 200 has already been born, which makes people in my business, the pension sector, worry a great deal. Turning to the second topic, deferring social security claiming. I've talked about this uh, a number of different places and I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, you ought to figure out how, what's the crossover point or what's the break even point. You ought to defer social security until you figure that you're gonna break even in terms of the extra number of years you're gonna live. It's true that over time, the US claiming age for men and women has been increasing. That is fewer and fewer people are quitting at age 62. The oldest claiming age has been and is now age 70. What a lot of people don't know is that every year you defer claiming your benefits, your benefits per month go up six to 8%. It's roughly actuarially neutral. So if you claim early or you claim late, the social security administration doesn't really uh, get affected by that uh, very much, but your eventual annuity payout, your income stream goes up quite a bit. And so one of the things I think we have to focus on is the need to get people to claim later. Um, in fact, up to the full retirement age and all the way to age 70, if possible. Now, of course, this is just a, a little picture of what happens. So the claiming age is the first column. The second column refers to your benefit that you're going to receive as a percent of your primary insurance amount. So you get your full primary insurance amount if you claim at age 67. It's reduced down to 70% if you claim at age 62. In other words, for every year you can delay claiming, say from 62 to 63, you get a benefit increase of 7.14%. And if you think about delaying all the way to age 70, your benefits will be 77% higher than they would have been uh, previously. So if you're worried about a lifetime income stream, delaying claiming is a very important means to that end. We know pre-COVID there was a huge retirement savings gap. The black line in this picture, the black bar, refers to the number of years of saving that the average American had accumulated, 8.3 years. The blue line refers to the number of years that the typical person might anticipate living to in retirement. So you can see right there, there was already a gap with Japan having the biggest gap. Gaps uh, have, all, have been in place pre-COVID. And the other issue, of course, is that social security itself has been facing shortfalls. This is a little bit of a complicated picture, but you have time running along the axis. 
the blue bar, the blue graph is the amount of revenues coming into the system. The red line is the benefits that have been scheduled to be paid under the current benefit formula. But as you no doubt know, the trust fund is going to be exhausted 2035, 2034. And at that point, benefits will have to be cut by 21% or taxes will have to be increased from 50 to 80%. And those are in the near term. Those numbers are not you know, far, far away. They're within many of our lifetimes. And so these are considerations that we're gonna have to take into account. Um, as for some of you that have been focused only on the health insurance scheme, the Medicare scheme, that's gonna be depleted in 2029. The combination of old age, social security and disability insurance is estimated to be um, depleted by 2034. If you want, you can go online and check out this, uh, this uh, little calculator that will tell you based on your age currently when the trust fund will run out. So I did this calculation for my daughter. She's in her early 30s and she will find that her social security benefits will have to be much, much less when the system runs short. So what can we do about it? Well, the main thing I think we have to think seriously about is retiring later. Here in this panel, we have men on the left and women on the right. The blue bar is what people really do. So for example, in the United States, men typically work up to about 65, maybe a little less. And then the little uh, diamond indicates what the system considers to be the normal retirement age. That doesn't mean what people are really doing. It's just where people get their full benefits. And you can see almost nobody works to 70, almost nobody works uh, to 75. And similarly uh, for women, women tend to retire somewhat younger. And again, almost nobody, nobody in fact works until they're 75. But the reality is that people have the capacity to work. Not everyone, but most people. This was a calculation that was done on men. And they asked the question, how many years of work additional could men work from 55 to 69? If they worked as much as men in 1977 who were that far from their life expectancy. And the answer is in the US, we could work over four years more. In the UK, we, they could work over eight years more. There's substantial additional work capacity. And our economy definitely needs to take advantage of this, especially given the very low fertility rates that we're seeing. The third question I asked was how to manage longevity risk. And to be able to think about that, sorry, um, to be able to think about that, we have the tally in 1975, 37.6% of couples had at least one member live to age 90. By 2005, almost 58%, 57% had at least one member of a couple, men 65, women 60, live to age 90. And almost two thirds are now living to age, have someone that's gonna be living to age 90. So this really highlights the importance, not only of longevity, but also the fact that it's going to be an increasing issue for more of us in the future. So this is the difference between probability of uh, surviving uh, beyond 65 versus life expectancy. So the first column we have, how many years left would a typical man have um, as of age 65? The answer is about 16 and a half women about 19 and a half. But there's a long right tail in that probability distribution. So if you look at the men age 85, a third of them will still be alive by age, age 85. Almost 20% will still be alive by age 90. And if you look at the women, a third of them will still be alive by age 90. So this really refers to the longevity risk problem. That is, you aren't just gonna necessarily li live to your life expectancy, but you could live a very long time after that, meaning you have to plan to not run out of money. So this is again, the survival ta tale, the probability of a 65 year old living to a given age by sex and year. 
So more than one in three women and one in five who are 65 will reach age 90. And this is something that a lot of people forget. They go online, they look at a life uh, a retirement calculator, you put in your age, you put in your sex, and they say, boom, you've got 17 years left. Well, maybe not. 50% of the people are going to live longer than that. I promise this is the only equation I'm going to be showing. So this is basically a, a, a formula to help you understand the value of a payout annuity. So this is basically the payment amount you get if you get $6,000 a year and this times the survival probability because in the simplest form, you only get the money if you're surviving and you have to discount it back to the present. And that yields the present value, the expected present value of the annuity. Now, of course, um, annuities typically pay benefits until you die, but you have to have mortality tables and discount rates to figure this out. And mortality has changed dramatically over time. Moreover, as you can see from this distribution of the age at death, annuitants are not like everybody else. Annuitants tend to have a rightward shifted distribution of age of death compared to the population as a whole. In other words, people who buy annuities have an expectation or a hint that they're going to need to draw on their assets for a long time. And so that's reflected in the two different distributions and insurance companies, of course, know that and price accordingly. So this is the money's worth uh, value for a life annuity in the US. It, the top row refers to the population um, mortality table. The bottom refers to the annuitant mortality table. Now, I use the population mortality table just to give you an example. And it says, if we assume that people who bought annuities lived as, just as long as the population mortality table, they would get an expected value of 81 cents per dollar premium. However, we know that's not everybody doesn't buy annuities, that annuitants buy annuities and they live longer. So the good news is if you're an annuitant, they use the annuity life table, your expected benefit per dollar spent is 93 cents per dollar. It's even better in Australia. The difference between the top row and the second row is a measure of adverse selection. The difference in the population survival versus the annuitant survival. But these are pretty good rates for insurance. And we can come back to that during the Q&A if you wish. The fourth topic is uh, kind of a gloomy one. It has to do with the fact that many experts believe that we will be in an era of persistent low returns for a very long time. Uh, researchers that have examined what happened after the other pandemics and epidemics in the, in the past suggests that the markets were depressed for 40 years after the pandemic, the Spanish flu in particular. And this is a graph over time of the federal funds rate adjusted for inflation. And you can see the Congressional Budget Office is projecting very low, in fact, negative Fed funds rates and negative 10-year US Treasury yields for some time to come. So this is a big challenge if we're trying to get people to think about saving for retirement. In the good old days, let's imagine you had a real rate of return of 3%. And you wanted to save enough so that your replacement rate at retirement would be about 50% of your pre-retirement income, assuming that Social Security could cover the rest. So if you started saving 40 years from retirement, say you're 25 years old, you're going to retire at 65, all you had to do was say, save 11%. If you were profligate, however, and didn't start saving until you were 45 years old, you'd have to save a quarter of your income to reach that target. But things have gotten more troublesome in this day and age. If your real return is only 1% and you started saving at age 25, you'd have to save almost a quarter of your salary. And heaven forbid you waited until you were 45 years old, you'd have to save almost half your salary. In other words, getting to retirement with a reasonable replacement rate has now required a lot more heavy lifting because of the low returns. 
I'm going to skip this one. This just shows how much more you have to save to buy yourself one year of retirement. Now, another thing that people have been uh, discussing is the need to have guaranteed payouts on um, retirement accounts. And it turns out that guarantees are especially expensive in times of low market returns. And this is from a model that we've developed to compare consumption without a guarantee minus consumption with a guarantee in percent. And as you can see between ages 30 and 100, right, there's not much of a difference in that consumption early on, but starting at about age 70 and certainly at about age 85, people that don't have guarantees in their retirement accounts end up consuming a lot more. And you can see the probability of higher consumption as a result. So the message is guarantees seem appealing to a lot of people, but they're extremely expensive in the current market environment. So are they useful? Well, we argue no, because they hurt consumption on average. The participants bear the cost of the guarantees through lower consumption, they lose wealth, on average, they don't help. A few people might be better off, but not overall. And so um, our analysis has suggested that life cycle funds like target date funds would be better than guarantees as long as you have sufficient equity in your portfolio in later life. So ultimately the guarantee offers surprisingly little protection in crash scenarios. The fifth topic I was going to cover was whether uh, required minimum distributions are going to be eliminated or not. Now, for some of you, this is probably, uh, you could probably recite this in your sleep, but initially the RMDs required from age 70 and a half that people who were retired withdraw from their retirement accounts a certain percentage, where that percentage was one over the expected number of years remaining. So that was the rule up until very, um, very recently. What was the rationale for forcing people to take money out of their accounts? Well, typically that's tax qualified money. That is you haven't paid tax on it when you put it into the account. And so the government wants its opportunity to get its tax grab uh, when the money comes out of the accounts. And as I'm sure you know, there was a 50% penalty tax if the withdrawals were less than the RMD. So this was a big, big uh, black cloud hanging over people. The SECURE Act of 2019 raised the RMD starting age, age 72. So that was a step in the direction of saying, yes, we still want your tax revenue, but we'll let you wait till later. And there's two other bills which are floating around, the Portman Cardin bill, said what we really should have is a progressive RMD. In other words, have a retired minimum distribution at age 75, but only levy it on people that have at least an aggregate of $100,000 or more in their tax qualified accounts. And then the Neil Brady bill uh, just proposed raising the RMD age to 75. So what we have done is try to model what the impacts of this would be taking into account a whole variety of different taxes and the impact on benefits and so forth. The US Committee, Joint Committee on Taxation estimated this would be quite an expensive um, effort to raise the RMD age just to age 72. And they, as far as I know, have not yet looked at raising it beyond 75. But just a quick sketch of our model, basically we look at how people are thinking about um, taking their social security and their RMDs. So you can take your social security as early as the early retirement age, the normal age or the late retirement age, which would be 70. And the RMD rules apply to how you withdraw your money during that period between 70 and death. But to do this right, we have to model wages we have to model social security payroll taxes and benefits. We have to model financial assets inside and outside 401k accounts. And we have to model all the key institutional rules. So we do this with numerical dynamic optimization. And what do we find? 
We find, first of all, that delaying the RMD age or even getting rid of it would have very little impact during the work life. It wouldn't dramatically change people's savings, their asset allocations inside and outside of tax qualified accounts, and it would have very little impact on social security claiming behavior. There is one group, however, that would be affected, and for them at least, in a positive direction. When people have a bequest motive, when they want to leave their retirement accounts to their heirs, delaying or eliminating the RMD will lead to lower tax payments on them, especially for the wealthiest 1% of taxpayers. The last topic, and I do want to leave some time for Q&A, it has to do with low financial literacy and the rise of dementia in late life. So I've developed with a colleague of mine, Ana Maria Luzardi, three questions, which are now called the big three questions for financial literacy. So the first question is the simplest. It says, let's say you have $100 in a savings account paying 2% interest per year. How much would you have in the account at the end of five years? Now, we didn't expect people to pull out their calculators or start compounding in their head or what have you. So we made it easy for them. It's either less than $102, equal to $102, more than $102, or you could say, I don't know, DK, or I refuse. So I suspect that everybody in, in this uh, webinar understands that the answer is more than $102. So not to keep you on tenterhooks. We're getting a little harder now. Imagine the interest rate on your savings account was 1% a year, but inflation was 2% a year. After one year with the money in this account, would you be able to buy more than today, equal to today, or less than today? Well, obviously, if you're only earning 1% and inflation is 2, then the value of the dollars are being eroded. So the answer has to be less than today. Now we're getting to the most difficult question. It's difficult because it talks about risk, which a lot of people don't understand, but it's easy in the sense that there's only two answers, true or false. So the question was true or false, buying a single company stock usually provides a safer return than a stock mutual fund. And the answer is false. A single company stock is not diversified. So when we asked these questions of Americans in the 2009 FINRA study, the interest rate question, only two thirds of them got that right. That was just, remember, it was after five years, do you have less than 102, equal to 102, or more than 102? That's pretty disappointing. 21% were incorrect, and another 14% didn't even want to hazard a guess. So that's a lot of financial illiteracy. Inflation, well, we haven't had a lot of inflation lately, but nonetheless, fewer than two thirds could get that right. Risk diversification. Remember, I told you that people, there was a 50 50 chance of getting it right. Well, about half of them got it right. And notice 34%, or adding one for refuse, 35% didn't even have a clue of how, about how to begin answering it. In fact, only one third of Americans of all age ranges, 18 to, I'm not sure, 70, could get all three questions right. And only half, less than half, 46%, got the first two right. And this is staggering because here we are every day making decisions about student loans, about car loans, about mortgages, about credit card debt, payday loans, et cetera. And we don't understand interest, risk diversification, and inflation. We also have that now done these studies around the world in a whole number of countries. And uh, so Germany, the first bar, I'm sorry if you're colorblind, this is uh, age 15 to 34. The middle bar is 35 to 54. And the last bar is age 55 plus. So Germany scores pretty well, especially um, in the first two age groups. The US is sort of in the middle. We don't do terribly well on either the first question, uh, sorry, in the, in the earlier groups or the later groups. And then if you go to China, they have very low financial literacy, which is not surprising because it's not really been a market economy and people have not necessarily been exposed to the kinds of financial 
risks and opportunities that we have in the US. But there are clear differences. And the unfortunate thing is people age 55 plus are not better informed. In fact, many of them are less well informed. So what works to enhance financial literacy? There's a lot of research that's been done talking about how financial education, especially in high school, is quite beneficial. Many employers are now pushing financial education in the workplace so that their employees are not getting calls from credit companies and bugging them to pay their bills and so forth. Um, I think that the new financial environment simply requires that people have greater financial literacy, given all these things that we're now required to do pretty much on our own without the employer or the government taking a huge amount of responsibility. And obviously, financial advice needs to be made through, not just to old age. In other words, at the point when you retire, you're making a whole number of financial decisions that you've probably never confronted before. When should I claim social security? Should I take a lump sum in my pension or should I buy an annuity? Um, which Medicare program should I opt for? And so this is not a one-stop shop. It has to be done throughout retirement. One of the biggest problems with the older uh, individuals um, is that people are very confident that they re retain their memory and their faculties that they had when they were young. So this is the actual uh, total word, word recall picture uh, following people from their 50s until their 90s, definite decrease in performance. But if you ask them how they rate their memory, self-rated, they're very confident that they're doing really well. And so this is a problem when you're dealing with older clients, older parents, um, yourself, your spouse. And we have to understand that that gap is there and it potentially could get worse. So how can we better manage retirement risk? This is the, the question, the conundrum. I guess I would say, first and foremost, we need to reinvent retirement. In the old days, when my parents retired, they quit at some point. Actually, my father was quite young, only 62, and played golf and did other things. Um, I think we have to think differently about retirement now. The baby boomer generation is actually trying to keep a foot in the workforce, trying to do volunteer work, do uh, beneficial work, positive things for society. But in order to be able to work longer, we have to continually build our human capital throughout our entire lives. It's not enough to go to high school or college, or even if you got an advanced degree, that's not enough. You have to reinvent and reinvest in your human capital every five to seven years. You have to invest in financial literacy, right? The things that we can now invest in didn't exist for our parents. Um, and even the traditional things like mortgages have gotten a lot more complicated and a lot more risky. I think we're going to have to save a lot more in addition to working a lot longer because of these low returns that we're confronting. We need to invest smarter, pay more attention to fees and exchanges and commissions and so forth, diversify better. And I'm a big fan of insuring against longevity. There's really no other product that can manage to pool the longevity risk other than an insurance product. I think there's also a growing need to make people's home equity accessible. Um, since around the world, the majority of older people have some equity in a home, the possibility of being able to get at that home equity without having to move out is very appealing. And that can, for example, be used to retrofit the home so that people can move in, up, move about, even if they don't, if, if they're in a wheelchair or if they're, um, if they're uh, have access problems. A big criterion and a big goal is to restructure public and private pensions. Social Security, as we've said, is in big trouble, and um, state-defined benefit pensions going through COVID have gotten into terrible trouble. They were already in bad trouble before. And defined contribution plans have their shortcomings as well. Of course, the biggest cure, uh, which we really need uh, help with, is to cure dementia. 
so that people are not going into their long, their retirement period having so such great needs in terms of both finances, long-term care, and so forth. So this is how we're going to ensure our greater retirement security for tomorrow. Three big questions I'll leave you with, and we can use those if you want to start the discussion. The first question is who should manage the risks facing the elderly? In the old days, let's say back in the 1900s, um, families would take care of grandma and grandpa if they could no longer plow the field, they could feed the chickens or they could watch the children or what have you. Then employers, many employers took on a paternalistic role for years and years. Governments took on that role as well. None of those individuals or groups are as uh, available to help manage elderly risks uh, these days compared to then. A related topic is how um, much can we afford to pre-fund our retirement needs versus simply taxing the young and using that money to pay the elderly? That's the latter, the pay-as-you-go approach is what has been um, the model for social security for years and years. But with declining fertility and extended longevity, we just don't have enough young people to be able to tax to support us all. And then the other big question in the, in the background is how much should we be paying in the form of pensions, that is income, versus healthcare? And the fact that Medicare is going to run into the red within three years is very much going to bring that issue to the fore. Stepping back, how much of the GDP of the nation's gross domestic product should go to the elderly and who should pay for it? That's really the big frame around this whole question. And ultimately, how do we get to political consensus? Simply say, oh, we should raise social security benefits for everybody is not an answer. Before I stop, I do want to have um, a little shout out to this new group we've just founded. It's called the International Pension Research Association. Here is its URL. It's a new organization. We've uh, founded it in concert with the OECD, the organization. Uh, <laughs> I can't even remember what OECD is right now. Sorry about that. Economic Cooperation and Development. And the vision of this organization is to be the global voice of research in the fields of pensions, aging, and retirement. So if you're interested in either contributing research or learning, by all means, feel free to do so. And I just wanted to uh, highlight that the center that I run at Wharton publishes a number of books and working papers every year. This is just a picture of a few of them. You can download these books for free and all the working papers mm -hmm. for free. And they range from financial literacy to remaking retirement to public pensions and so on down the line. And last but not least, I don't expect you to be able to follow all the fine print, but if you're interested in some of our papers on this topic, um, I'll leave that list with the organizers and they will make it available to you if you wish. So with that, I think I'll stop and we'll turn it over to questions and answers. Devin. Well, first of all, Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for uh, preparing some, some slides that are somber in some areas, but you know, uh, um, opportunistic in other areas. Uh, there are a number of questions that I'd like to get to. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you too for, uh, you know, we think that the retirement space is evolving, right? The research and, and all the information is, it's a body of knowledge that is evolving. And so it's not, uh, it's not quite as settled, I suppose, as some of the other topics that we, we tend to address. And so looking forward to that additional research that's coming out, of course, research from the Investments and Wealth Institute as well, um, that definitely uh, encourage our audience to, to continue to, to keep a careful eye on that research coming out. Now, a lot of the questions that came through were, were actually fairly political in nature. So without getting political, um, I, I would ask though, what, what is the solution? How are we going to become from so underfunded to funded? And is that even feasible given our political situation right now? Uh -huh. 
Uh, you know, I've been working on social securities problems as well as underfunded pensions for my entire career. And uh, when I first started working, it was the time of the famous Greenspan Commission, the 1983 commission appointed by the president, Albert Greenspan was the head of it. And they quote unquote, fixed social security. That is, they were um, able to raise taxes slowly, raise the retirement age slowly, put in place some benefit cuts, but it all they had 75 years before for it to uh, bear fruit. Well, here we are all these years later, and we've, I think, wasted some key opportunities. Um, I mean, some folks say social security is an easy problem to solve in that it's just about money, right? You just have to raise taxes 50 to 80% or cut benefits by a quarter to a third. And then you'll be able to, or something in between, and then you'll be able to keep that going. The harder problem is Medicare because the fact that that's going broke means that we're gonna to have to rethink the way we deliver me medical services and also potentially ration. And that's never going to be very popular. I absolutely agree. And, and you know, most of the clients that we deal with are, are on the higher end of the income and, and net worth scale. Um, so means testing is something that comes up frequently. Uh, clients, even though they understand mathematically the benefits of waiting to claim uh -huh. Social Security, they almost kind of feel this this uh, compulsion to, to claim it while we still have it, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, but uh, do you, do you, did your research come across anything from a, a means testing perspective? And, and what are some of the, um, the, the opinions about that? Um, well, on the claiming while we claim it now, while we still have it uh, point, I would like to argue that if your benefits could go up by 77% by waiting to age 70, and then there had to be a cut because social security was running short. I would rather have a cut on my benefits that were 77% higher than on my benefits that were lower because I claimed too early. So I, I don't buy that argument particularly. In terms of means testing, um, in some sense, social security benefits are already means tested in a backdoor sense for the following reasons. If you have income in retirement over a certain adjusted gross income threshold, then eight, I think it's 85% of your social security benefits above that are subject to income tax. So in a sense, you are already paying more tax on your benefits or getting less benefits, if you will, because of that structure. Um, it is possible, one might imagine, to revert to a system where nobody would get benefits unless they had you know, very little income and essentially no assets. But that would be very unpopular moving to that situation. I put in mind of uh, Claude Pepper, who was a congressman, I believe from Florida. And he used to say, a program for the poor is a poor program. And you know the argument being that if we're all thinking about being in social security together, then we're much more likely to be able to support it as a nation politically. So it's a, it's a I think it's it may be part of the solution, um, but it certainly won't be enough. I think to fix the system across the board. Oh, certainly the math is difficult and certainly the politics around the math can be very difficult. I want to switch gears for just a moment and talk about the, the human side of retirement because you've addressed it a couple of times here. Um, you know, what we see sometimes from seniors, uh, maybe let's just call them 60 and above, their employers may not seem to value their employment as much as we'd hope that they would. Do you see any, any issues with uh, people of advanced age and retaining their employment and continuing that employment, uh, 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 you know, beyond an advanced age. I think I should correct you that 60, plus, 60 is not an advanced age. I knew you were going to call me out on that because I blanked on the number. But uh, the, the the question specifically asked about 60 or older, it, do, yeah. it does seem like employers don't value their employees who are 60 and above. 
Well, I've certainly had conversations with a number of people who felt that they were either being gently or not so gently eased out of their jobs at some point. Um, the reality, though, is that once our economy gets back into full employment again, we simply don't have the number of young folks who are properly skilled to be able to replace the retiring older folks. So I think that that's a positive in the sense that employers are going to have to start retraining older workers, maybe adapting the workplace so the lighting is better or the floors aren't so slippery or what have you. This is all already being done in a number of um, countries. For example, in Germany, they've reconstructed the BMW assembly plant so that older workers can do it with less physical stress. And I think that's what we're going to have to see. Now, I um, there are some proposals right now from the Biden administration. I think uh, Bernie Sanders has a proposal on the table for Medicare and so forth. What do you think of the current proposals that are out there? Are there any that strike you as interesting that, that could work? I'll have to say honestly that I'm not as, uh, um, knowledgeable about Medicare proposals as I might be, what I would say is that without any ability to negotiate prices for pharmaceuticals and treatments, it's going to be tough to fix the system. Um, I know early on there was discussion about a public option. It's not obvious to me that's a, a real winner, but um, you know every system has its flaws. The Canadian system has rationing. And that's one reason it ends up spending less. And people from north of the border come down to Detroit to get their fMRIs and CAT scans and so forth. So every system has a, an issue. Um, I do think that the advent of COVID and the pandemic exposed some big problems with the US healthcare system because every state was left to itself. And some states did a really great job tamping down the pandemic. And some states, like my state, Pennsylvania, was completely in chaos. So um, I think that there are matters of public health that will probably require more federal intervention, um, even though it may not be that popular. Do you see any countries out there that are getting this math equation right? Mm. Can we learn anything from any other countries that you feel like is kind of leading the way in this area? Well, I've always been a big fan of the Australian system. The Australians put in place um, a national mandatory defined contribution plan. They call it their superannuation system. And they have required, I think it's 10% uh, of the um, everybody's wage be put into these um, centrally operated, privately run companies who manage the money. And so people have been saving for a number of years. They've been making good returns. It's a fairly well understood system. They have one big flaw though. When they put that system into place, they allowed people to take a lump sum at age 55 and do whatever they wanted with it. And there's a second piece, which is if you get to be 65 and you're impoverished in Australia, you can come with your hand out and say, I'm poor, give me the old age guaranteed benefit, which it's like a welfare benefit for the elderly. So as a result, a lot of people have taken their lump sum at, at 55 prior to COVID and traveled around the world to have their overseas experience, come back, hold their hands out and want to be paid and are successfully getting it. The other thing they have not quite figured out is how to value people's houses as part of their means test. So as a result, everybody's piling all their free money into their homes, leading to a skyrocketing housing price situation. And so the, the accumulation piece is good. The decumulation piece needs work. That's what I would say. I think that's really well said. And by the way, we'll give a quick shout out to our Australian members. I know we have a few of them on our call today. There's We have a, a society of SEMAs in Australia. So uh, shout out to them. Thanks for joining us as well. 
Um, you mentioned kind of home prices, and, and I think earlier in the presentation, you even mentioned tapping into yeah. some of that home equity. Um, is that going to is that going to become a product that you think is is going to become more utilized as the demographics push people into those older ages? Uh, I would say that there's some room for optimism, but there's also some ro re uh, room for caution. The during um, I think it was 2008 nine I believe the Obama administration raised the level of um, essentially reinsurance for people um, who are willing to sell home equity loans. And so the problem is if I want to offer, let's say an older household, a loan against their house that I get repaid at the point when uh, the elderly person or couple leaves the house, they die or they go to a nursing home or what have you. But, um, that's risky because we don't really know how long people are going to live and we don't know if they're going to keep the house up and so forth. So the federal government in the housing and urban development group was providing reinsurance for these loans. So the Obama administration raised the, the value of the loans, which I think was uh, appropriate and helpful. But at the same time, um, the reality is that older people have been taking larger and larger mortgages over time. And this was particularly highlighted during the 0809 crisis when it turned out that a lot of people ended up being foreclosed on their mortgages because they had very little equity in the homes, they had um, not paid back very much of their debt. So there is the opportunity now, but um, I think that hopefully people are not seeing the home and flipping homes as the way into retirement wealth, because I'm afraid it's not going to be that way for some time to come. Now, unfortunately, COVID changed a lot of things. It yeah. changed a lot of financial situations. Uh, you can think of retirees who are maybe five to 10 years to, before retirement, maybe they they experienced job loss or a household shock or, you know, health problems or, or God forbid, you know, losing somebody to COVID. Right. Um, do you think we've paid the price yet for this, or are we going to start to see major disruptions in future data as a result of this point in time? Well, the main thing that we still don't know, of course, is how how the unfolding of the COVID virus and how its variants and so forth will affect the population. Um, if most people get vaccinated and if the vaccines are successful against some of these variants, which are now tearing up India and parts of Africa, um, then I think that the economy can start to return to normal and generate jobs and so forth. So that's kind of a good scenario. On the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, there has been research suggesting that after a major world pandemic, it takes capital markets about 40 years to get back to normal. And um, that could be a real bath of cold water for all of those of us trying to save for retirement and make our pennies grow. So that's, uh, that's a matter of concern. I would say to be safe, we should start thinking about working longer, delaying claiming, delaying retirement. Um, some folks are now moving abroad, you know, to um, places like Panama or Costa Rica where the cost of living is lower and the medical costs are lower and such. I'm not sure I would do that. I still want to see my grandchildren, but um, you know, there are, there are avenues that people can take to try to reduce their expenses. Now you've uh, you mentioned insurance as you know a, as probably the product that can address the longevity risk. Um, are there any other products that you see out there? I see uh, Bob Merton who will be on our program tomorrow talking about selfies. We hear uh, Moshe Molesky from from York University in Toronto talking about tontines. Are there any more uh, exotic products that you see that can help uh, address some of those same issues? One of the obstacles to selfies and tontines is that they're prohibited legally in the US. So that's not a very good place to start. Um, I would say that the essence of longevity protection is risk pooling. That is getting into a pool of people, 
none of whom are, know how long they're going to live. Some will live a long time, some will not. But pooling that risk across the members of the pool so that the if I die young, my assets go to the people who live a long time and vice versa. And there is no other product in the capital market like that today, other than, of course, Social Security, which is a longevity protection program at the national level. But the issue with social security is that it's underfunded. It's never been fully funded. And it's always relied on future generations to pay for older generations. And that's what I think we can't do anymore with the collapse of fertility. Uh, and COVID made that worse, by the way. Fertility is down even more in the US and most countries. So I think financing our retirement thinking about ways to stay busy and potentially paid, at least part-time in retirement, those are all promising options. Uh, and many baby boomers are very much on board with that. Uh, I've been running a survey called the Health and Retirement Study since 1992, and there's a marked change in attitude over time. The boomers are now saying, I don't want to quit full-time. I want to move in, I want to start a business. Of course, that may be risky too. I want to um, do volunteer work, but all those things are ways to stay engaged, not only with the workplace, but with other people. And we believe that has a positive impact on mental capacity as well. Retiring early is not very good for you. Yeah, there's there's definitely some some side effects to retiring early, and uh, we do have quite a few clients that that do that, and it certainly uh, changes the mathematics of that retirement. Yeah. Now, we mentioned earlier that the body of knowledge in retirement is still expanding. You know, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, you mentioned you know some of the the, the new association. I, I forget what what it's called. You might have to remind yeah. me. Um, but what are the future research projects that you're working on? What should we be looking for um, that we can use in our practice and, and, and uh, you know, inform our clients about? Well, as you may have gleaned, I am a, a, um, I am a fan of um, annuities, not the fancy reset ratchets with bells and whistles and all that, just plain vanilla longevity insurance products. And so one of the things that the SECURE Act did was enable plan sponsors to include income payout annuities in their defined contribution plans. But what I've been pushing for is reasons to include annuities as a default. In other words, if you don't do anything else, then at least you'll have some in income protection as long as you live. So the way we've been trying to put it together is to say, nobody wants to annuitize 100% of their assets. That's just too difficult a, um, a thing to sell. But you could say to people, look, at age 65 or 67, whatever it is, put 10% of your nest egg, your 401k plan assets, into a deferred annuity, which will start paying you, let's say, at age 80. And if you do that, it would dramatically increase people's consumption in old age because you have 15 years over which that annuity investment can grow. And, you know, the, the risk is such that you may not live a lot beyond 80. So it's a really perfect product to include as a default. Now, the only caveat I would say is that if you only have $10,000 in your 401k, you should not try to annuitize that, right? Because it would be ridiculous. Um, but so what we computed is if you had at least $60,000 in your 401k, you would have significantly higher consumption after age 80 if you bought a deferred annuity. So I think that's the direction that I would like to see things go. Well, that's uh, you know, I'm, I'm eager to see some of that research. We're we're starting to see some of that research about the presence of an annuity in a portfolio. There, uh -huh. there could be some, uh, you know, efficiency uh, benefits. There could be some diversification benefits. There could even be some behavioral benefits, allowing almost kind of giving uh, retirees permission to spend their assets, which is yep. sometimes a challenge. Exactly. Um, so I'm I'm eager to see the research that comes about. 
Um, thank you so much for joining us. I, I hope this was helpful for all of our audience. I, you sparked a lot of conversation, by the way. There was a ton yeah. of questions that I couldn't get to. Um, I would encourage those folks that, uh, that have additional questions Go ahead and uh, there's a there's a discussion forum in the Chime uh, platform on the, the left hand navigation. Uh, go ahead and start communicating with each other. I, I'd be interested to see what your responses are to each other about some of those questions, and uh, let's see if we can spark a little bit of that engagement that way. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. I appreciate it. To me, if you want to share the questions to me, I'd be interested. Oh, great. So, uh, how can they reach you, Dr. Mitchell, uh, to to maybe answer some of those questions? Oh, so my email is um, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-O, only one L, so Mitchell O, at Wharton, that's W-H-A-R-T-O-N, dot U-P-E-N-N, that's U -P -E -N -N dot E-D-U. Very well said. I think they can also Google your name and find your faculty page at Wharton, and I think they can contact you that way as well. Uh, uh, once again, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for, for joining us. I'm looking forward to your, um, your articles that you submit to our publications so kindly for uh, dedicating some of your time to do that. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Good luck. Thank you so much. Much appreciated.